Hello everyone, welcome to today's video. In today's video, we'll be going through the work solutions of the Opportunity Class for 2022 past paper, which was recently released. Um, I highly recommend that you, before you watch this video, boys and girls, that you work through this paper so you are a bit more familiar with the questions um, as I explain through the solutions to each of these questions today. Let's begin. So having a look at question one. Question one says this, two parcels are each weighed on different scales. Now one scale is labeled in grams and the other in kilograms. What is the difference between the masses of the two parcels in the diagram? So as you can see here, they've given us a diagram. You can see the scales, which is what's been used to weigh these items. We've got parcel one and parcel two. Now you can see the different units, one's in grams and the other one in kilograms. Now, the key part of this question is, what is the difference? As soon as you see the word difference, you know that you have to subtract which means two minus. So let's have a look at parcel one. Parcel one, you can see that the arrow is pointing to how much it weighs. And in this case, parcel one weighs 800 grams. Now, if we have a look at parcel two, parcel two is in kilograms and you can see that it's at three quarters of a kilogram because the one kilogram is over here. So we know that parcel two is three quarters of one kilogram. Now the key thing is actually working this out um, and breaking down this one kilogram into something smaller so you can actually see what unit it is. So we're going to actually break it down into grams. Now we know that one kilogram is 1000 grams. So we're going to go three quarters of mean of 1000 grams. And so this is work using working out um, quantities of fractions of quantities of a fraction. And so in this case, we have to go 1000 divided by four, which is equal to 250. Then you've got to times it by the numerator. So 250 times three, which is equal to 750 grams. So now we know that parcel two weighs 750 grams. Now it's a matter of actually subtracting to work out the difference between them. So we need to go 800 grams minus 750 grams to know that there is a 50 gram difference between them. And so therefore our answer to question one is a 50 grams. Okay, so that's question one. Let's have a look at question two now. So question two says this. It says, a factory makes three cars every eight hours. Now, if the factory runs all day and all night, Monday to Saturday, Sunday, how many cars does it make in a whole week? Okay, so there is quite a bit of information, two separate pieces of information that we've got to know to then be able to solve this question. And the first one is this. We know that the factory makes three cars every eight hours. Now to help us actually solve through this, we're gonna actually write this into a number sentence, okay? Which, and in any case, a number sentence just involves that um, being able to see it and then work our way down to get to the actual answer. And sometimes that may involve just an equal sign just to see how they relate. So what we know is that three cars is made in every eight hours. So three cars is equal to eight hours, okay? Now, if the factory runs all day and all night, Monday to Sunday, how many cars does it make in a whole week? So this is a second piece of information that we actually have to um, work out. So from Monday to Sunday, we know that that's seven days in the week. And we know that there are 24 hours because it says it runs all day and all night. So we actually need to work out how many hours that actually is. So 24 times seven, if we solve that, seven times four is 28, carry on the two. Seven times two is equal to 14 plus two is equal to 16. So we know that that means in one week, that's 168 
hours. So we want to find out how many cars is made in 168 hours. How many cars is this? So if we have a look, we need to ask ourselves, how does 8 get to 168? So times what gives us 168? And the same thing here, times what gives us ha how many cars? So to be able to get from 8 to 168, times in what? We're going to divide that. So do the opposite operation. So we're going to go 168 divided by 8. So 8 goes into 1, 0 times. 8 goes into 16 as a two-digit number. 2 times 16 subtract is 0. Bring down the 8. 8 goes into 8 once. So 8 subtract is 0 with no remainder. So that means we have to multiply by 21. So the same thing here. 3 times 21 to find out how many cars has been made. So 21 times 3 is 3 times 1 is 3. 3 times 2 is 6. So that's 63 cars in total. So therefore our answer to question 2 is C63. Okay, over the page. So let's have a look at question 3. So question 3 says this. It says here is a large triangle with equal sides. It is made of 16 identical smaller triangles. Some of the smaller triangles are shaded. Now Miriam wants to shade only one more small triangle so that the dotted line is a line of symmetry. Which triangle should she shade? Now the key thing is understanding what this question is asking for. Here we've got this diagram here. Now we can see that it's a triangle with equal sides and it's made up of 16 smaller triangles throughout um, this. Now you can see that there is a bit of a dotted line and we know that Miriam wants to shade only one more square so that this dotted line is actually a line of symmetry. So symmetry meaning, boys and girls, that if I cut a shape in half or draw a line down, both sides are going to look exactly the same. So I'm actually going to define this line a bit more strongly so we can actually see which part is needed so that both sides look exactly the same. So if we have a look here, we're going to now compare. So these sides are exactly the same. These sides are exactly the same. Yep, these sides are all exactly the same. Now if you have a look at these triangles, these ones are the same. These ones are the same. But these two are different and this one's the same. So that means that tells us that we need to shade this triangle here for it to look exactly the same. And so once we've found out which triangle it is, we choose which triangle out of the answer options, A, B, C, D, E, um, which one is the triangle that needs to be shaded, and that one is C. So our answer to question three is C, C. All right, over the page, let's have a look at the next part. So having a look at question four. Question four says this. Three years ago, the total of Sunil's and Helen's ages was 27. Now in five years from now, what will be the total of their ages? Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to write a number sentence to give us a bit of an idea. So we know that three years ago, the total of Sunil's and Helen's ages was 27. So I'm just going to write three years ago, just to help us remember that. Sunil plus Helen is equal to 27. Now in five years from now, so this is three years ago, five years from now, so that's five years later, what will Sunil and Helen's ages be? Essentially, that's what they're trying to work out. So, technically, from three years ago to five years later, if we actually combine these two amounts, that's eight years, okay? Three plus five, that's going to be eight years in difference. So that means Sunil would have aged eight years more, but 
Helen would have also aged eight years as well because both of them are both aging at the same time. It's not like one person is not aging, the other one isn't aging. So eight plus eight, that's 16 years um, that they've both added together to their ages. So technically, to work out what their total ages will be, we need to go 27 plus 16 years, which is equal to 43. And so our answer to question four is E43. All right, let's have a look down below here to the next question, which is number five. Okay, so number five says this. Miro makes a rectangular prism using cubes. Now it says, here are three more rectangular prisms. The cubes in these prisms are the same size as the cubes in Miro's prism. So we've got prism one, prism two, and prism three. Now the question is, which of these prisms has or have the same volume as Miro's prism? And then you've got your answer options, A, B, C, D, and E. So first of all, let's find out how many cubes exactly um, this mirror's rectangular prism has. So if we have a look here, we're going to use the volume. So volume is doing length times width times height. So I'm just going to write that down. Volume is equal to length times width width times height. And so in this case, it would be two cubes, and that would actually tell us how many cubes we need. So two, or we, Mira has used. So two by three by two, which is equal to 12 cubes in total. So that's how many cubes Mira has made, and we're going to try and find out which one has the same volume. So if we have a look at volume, prism one, um, the amount of cubes being used is two, four, six, eight. 10, 12, so that's 12 cubes. If we have a look at prism 2, we've got 2, 4, 6, 8, 10 cubes. And this was a lot easier just to count because it's in that single row. Now prism 3, we're going to do length times width times height. So there's 2 across here, 2 across here, and 3 across here. So the volume is 2 times 2 times 3. So 4 times 3, which is also 12 cubes. So if we have a look, we've got two that have the same volume as the um, rectangular prism up above. And so our answer is D, prisms 1 and 3 only. Okay, so that's question 5. Let's have a look at question 6. So having a look at question 6, it says this. A birthday party lasted four hours and 25 minutes. Now it finished at quarter to three. When did the party start? So first of all, let's actually work out um, what quarter to three is in digital time because it's a lot easier to work with um, um, to work backwards with because it's actual numbers rather than like a saying of in analog time. So if we have a look, quarter to three, quarter to three means we know a quarter of an hour is 15 minutes. And in this case, 15 minutes to kind of means, or it actually me refers to that there's 15 minutes until three o'clock. Okay. So there's 15 minutes until three o'clock, which means the time is actually 2.45 p.m. So this is when it ended. And so we want to find out what time the party started. So we're going to slowly work our way backwards. I like to break it down, um, break down this number here um, slowly. So um, we can always start off with the hours. So we're going to subtract four hours first. So minus four hours, which is equal to 10 45 a.m. So 2.45 p.m. minus 4 hours is 10.45 a.m. And then what we're going to do is we're going to subtract another 25 minutes from there. So when we're subtracting the minutes, we need to look at the minute section on this end here. So 45 minus 25 will, is 20 minutes. So that's going to be 10, 20, 
a.m. And so we know that this is when it started. Now, boys and girls, I know that I've assumed that we're using p.m. because it's 2.45 p.m., seeing that the birthday it's a birthday party that wouldn't start early in the morning, but it doesn't 100% really matter because there's no a.m. p.m. indication in the question in itself. So, but if we have a look, just in case we've used it, but also consider that it could have been 2.45 a.m. as well, but it just would have mean the party would have started at 10.20 p.m. Anyways, 10.20 a.m. or it's before the 30 sign, so it's actually going to be 20 minutes. So if we have to translate this into um, analog time, it would be saying that there's 20 minutes past 10 o'clock. So 20 minutes past 10, which is why our answer to question 6 is A. Okay, let's keep going. Question 6, question 7. So question 7 says, what is the total length of all the lines in this grid? So if we have a look, we're looking at all of these lines this way, going uh, horizontally and vertically, and then... Um, working out the total length of that. So essentially working out the perimeter, not just around, but within all of these other grids. So we've been, we have been told that each of these lines is worth three meters, both um, vertically and horizontally. So it's a matter of being able to calculate and work out how many of these lines we have. So if we have a look, we've got one, two, three, four, five lines vertical and so I'm just going to write that down five vertical lines and then we've also got one two three four and five five lines horizontal so five horizontal lines and so that means in total, we've got 10 lines and they're all three meters each. So we're going to go 10 lines multiplied by three meters, which is equal to 30 meters in total, which is why the answer is E, 30 meters. Okay, so that's question seven. Let's move on over the page to question eight. So having a look at question eight, this is what it says. It says, in the diagram below, each star is equal to 3. Now the values of the stars are multiplied, so 3 by 3 is equal to 9. So as you can see here, you can see across how it works. 3 times 3 is equal to 9. Now it says that the diagrams below work in that same way as well. So if we know that the one symbol is exactly is equal worth one, that means the same of these symbols would be exactly the same as well. So you can see there's a diagram and it says what number belongs in the empty box here. So let's slowly solve through this. So we've got to find two numbers that are exactly the same that times to give us 36. And in this case, our knowledge of square numbers is quite important because six times six is equal to 36. And same thing here, two numbers that are exactly the same that multiply to give us 64 in this case, 8 times 8 is equal to 64. And so now we need to combine it to work out what our answer is in this case here. So 6 times 8 is equal to 48. So what number belongs in the empty box? Our answer to this question 8 is C, 48. All right, having a look at question 9. So question 9 says this. Well, as you can see, we've got a little diagram of object one, object two, object three. And it says, which of these three dimensional objects has or have exactly five faces, eight edges and five vertices? Um, and we've got our options A, B, C, D, E, e here. So what's really important is to actually see um, and slowly work our way through it. So object one has... How many faces? So sides, we've got one, two, three, four, five. So there's five faces. How many edges? We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So that's eight edges. And then how many vertices? We've got one, 
two, three, four, five. So that's five vertices as well. Okay, so I'm just going to give it a bit of a clean just so we can see everything a bit more clearly. Okay. Let's have a look at object two. So object two has one, two, three, four faces. It's got one, two, th one, two, three, four, five, six, six edges, and one, two, three, four, four vertices. Okay. And then we've got object three, which has it's a triangular prism, so we've got one, two, three, four, five. So that's got five faces. It's got one, two, three, four, five, six vertices, which are your corners. And then the edges, it has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight edges as well. Okay, so which of these three dimensional objects has or have exactly five faces, eight edges, and five vertices? So if we have a look at this, our answer to this question is only A. Option A is the only one that has these properties. So our answer to question 9 is A. Okay, so let's have a look at question 10 now. Question 10 says this. It says Lucy has three counters. Each counter has a different number on it as shown. So we've got two, nine, and three. Now it says she uses all the counters to make different three-digit numbers. Now the question is, what is the difference between the smallest odd three-digit number she can make and the smallest even three-digit number she can make? So, boys and girls, um, there's actually two ways that you can work it out. You can either use your knowledge of numbers and um, the different properties it has to be able to work out immediately what your smallest odd and smallest even could be. Or if you're unsure about it, you can actually list all the different combinations of three digit numbers you can make with these three digits, which isn't too much, um, but it def definitely does take a bit more time. So we're gonna go with the first option where we're gonna use our number knowledge to help us solve this. So to make out we need to try and make our smallest odd three digit number. So smallest odd, and it's a three digit number, one, two, three. Now the key thing of what makes a number odd is when their ending, is when the ending here is an odd number. Now in this case here, an odd number is zero, or in this case here, the odd numbers, odd digits could be one, three, five, seven, or nine. In this case, we've only got a three and we've only got a nine. So through nine and three. So, and if we want to make it the smallest um, odd number, three digit odd number, we want to make sure that the higher the digit is in the lower place value. So if this is a ones and tens, we want to put a nine there instead of a three and then put the three here. So it'd be 39, not 93. And so two is our smallest digit anyway. So it's going to be 239. Now, following that same concept, we need to make the smallest even number. And so once again, using our logic, to make something even, our ending has to be the even number. And there's only two that is an even number in these three options, three digits. So we've got two here. And since it's got to be the smallest number, we're going to put 392. So once again, we have to work out the difference, which means two minus. So we're going to go, okay, 392 minus 239, subtract. So 2 take away 9, we can't do, so we're going to borrow. So that's 8, 1. 12 minus 9 gives us 3. 8 minus 3 is equal to 5. 3 minus 2 is equal to 1. So that means our difference here is 153, which is why the answer is D. Okay, having a look down at question 11. Question 11 says this. 
My pet lizard is 23 centimeters long. My pet cat is twice as long as my lizard. My pet dog is 35 centimeters longer than my cat. My pet stick insect is 60 millimeters long. How much longer is my dog than my pet stick insect? Okay, so we're going to slowly put all of this information that we've just gathered all here into number sentences to slowly work our way through it. So what we know is this, the lizard here is 23 centimeters long. And then we've got a cat who is twice as long as the lizard. So it's actually just going to be double that. 23 plus 23 is equal to 46 centimeters. I'm going to just write 23 times 2 because it's twice as long. Then we've got a dog that is 35 centimeters longer than the cat. So that's going to be 35 plus 46, which is equal to 81 centimeters. And we know that the stick insect is equal to 60 millimeters, which is actually just six centimeters. Because remember, the key thing is working with the same um, unit. So if it's in millimeters, change it to centimeters or change the centimeters to millimeters. But the number gets quite big. So we're going to try and keep it to centimeters in this case. And not only that, if you have a look at your options, they're all in centimeters as well. So you want to keep it to centimeters. So we go, okay, 81, 81. Take away six. So we borrow 7, 1, 11 take away 6 is 5, 7 take away nothing is 7. So the difference between them or how much longer something is, is 75 centimeters, which is why the answer is E. Now the key thing is, boys and girls, knowing that as soon as you see this phrase, how much longer, you need to know you have to minus straight away because it's trying to tell us what's the difference between these two amounts. So that's why our answer to question 11 is equal to... Okay, so why don't we move on to the next page, having a look at question 12. Now, question 12 says this. It says, a hardware store sells the following items. We've got nails for 20 cents, bolts for 15 cents, and screws for 10 cents. Now, we know that Jimmy buys one item and pays with $1. Now, he receives change made up of three different coins, all of different values. Which of the items could he have bought? So, we know that he's bought one item, either the nails, the bolts, or the screws, and he pays it with $1, and he receives change of three coins, all of different amounts. So, change is the amount of money you receive after, like the leftover money you receive after paying something. So, we know he's used $1 to pay for something. We're going to work out the change for each of these amounts, Okay. So if we have a look, nails for 20 cents, the change here is equal to 80 cents, 85, 15 cents, and the change here in this case is 85 cents. And if screws were 10 cents, that means the change here is 90 cents. So we're going to actually work out what coin combinations can we make to create the change. And remember, it's, we're going to try and aim to get it as three different um, coins. So 80 cents, I can use a 50 cent coin, a 20 cent coin, and a 10 cent coin, which works. 85 cents, I would be using a 50 cent coin, 20 cent coin, 10 cent coin, and a 5 cent coin, which is four coins, so it doesn't quite work. And 90 cents, I would use a 50 cent coin, 20 cent coin, and another 20 cent coin. Now, if we have a look, the only one that works is nails for 20 cents, 80 cents, because one, it uses three different values um, and it uses, which is what we expect, wh what the criteria was asking us. So which items could he have bought? Our only option is A, the nail only. It can't be screws, even if it uses three different coins, because two of the coins are the same. So that's why our answer to question 12 is A, nails only. Okay, having a look at question 13. So question 13 says this, Sam is looking at a map. He sees that a path runs from his house to a mountain. Now Sam thinks the path goes north, then northeast, then west. Sam then realizes he has the map upside down. So in which direction does the path actually go from Sam's house to the mountain? So this one sounds like a bit of a confusing question, but it's actually not as tricky as you think it would be. 
Anyway, so if we actually, what we're going to do is we're probably going to, we're going to start off by drawing um, compass directions. So never eat soggy wheat picks to get us started. And then we're going to slowly work our way through it. So what we know is that from he, we're going to start off by reading through the instructions that Sam has originally started with. So we know that he sees a path that runs from his house to a mountain. So from his house, he's got his house here. And then he thinks the path goes north, then goes northeast, and then it goes west across like that, okay? So that's what we know so far. Now, he realizes that the map is upside down, and we're assuming that the mountain is here. Now, he realizes that the map is upside down. So if, if it's upside down, then we know that we'd have to go into the opposite direction. So in which direction does a path actually go? So what we're going to say is instead of, we're going to write down here, it was north and then it went northeast in the original one and then west. So we're going to actually do the opposite of all of these. So if we went north, the opposite would be south. If we went northeast, then the opposite would be southwest. So northeast is this way, southwest is going to be this way. So southwest and if it went west, the opposite would be east. And so out of our options, the only one that shows that, um, that goes south, southwest, and then east is our answer D. Okay, so logically, I mean, boys and girls, what you can do is you can turn around your map and then see that it does indeed go south, southwest, and then east because it's turned around. Okay, and so our answer to question 13 is D as well. It's a bit of a confusing concept because you'd have to think, okay, if it's upside down, then it's going the opposite. So that's the key thing you have to try and remember immediately. Okay, let's move on to the next question. So having a look at question 14. Question 14 says this. This diagram is made up of five squares. So you can see one, two, three, four, five, and the diagram is not to scale. And the question is, what is the side length of the shaded square? So we're going to try and work out what this side length of the shaded square is. So this one, what we've got to do is we've got to see how all these other squares are related to to be able to work out what the side length of this one is. Now, boys and girls, keep in mind the property of a square. Remember that a square means that all sides are the same. So if you have a look at this square here, the top one, if this is five centimeters, that means this is also five centimeters, this is also five centimeters, and this is also five centimeters. Same thing with this smaller square. If this is three, that means this is three, three, and three. And so using that logic, we should be able to work out what the rest of these are. So I'm going to turn your attention to using the right squares, these two squares that are here. So if we have a look, this first square is five centimeters, and that means this side here is also five centimeters. Now we also know that this is three centimeters, that means this section here is also three centimeters. That means that this is telling us that this tiny square here, the side length is two centimeters, because two plus three is equal to five. So that means this is two centimeters, this is also two centimeters. So that means that this whole section here is going to be because we know this amount is five centimeters. Five centimeters plus two centimeters means that this whole section here is seven centimeters. And so now we know that what the side length of this square is, that means that this section here is seven centimeters. And we know that this here is two centimeters. So that means this combined seven plus two centimeters is nine centimeters. So we've just worked out that the side length of this shaded square is nine by nine centimeters. So that means the side length of the shaded square is B, nine centimeters. So I think the key thing, boys and girls, to remember is that all sides in square are the same slash equal. Okay, so our answer to question 14 is B. Okay, having a look now at question 15. 
Question 15 says this. In a shop selling kitchen items, the cost of 10 plates is the same as the cost of 4 plates and 4 bowls. Now the question is, how many bowls would cost the same as 9 plates? Okay, so what we've got to do here is we're going to use number sentences to slowly work this out. So, what we know is this. 10 plates is equal to 4 plates. And mind you, boys and girls, the plates and plates are all the same. Plus four bowls. Now what we're going to do is, like we just said, the plates and the plates are the same. So we're going to actually subtract out the plates. So we're going to subtract out the plates. And I'm going to minus four plates from here to work out how much it actually costs for just the bowls. So 10 minus four is equal to six plates. And so that equals to four bowls. Six plates is equal to four bowls. Now what we're going to do is we need to work out how much it is, how much it is for nine plates. So we're going to slowly work our way. You can see from six to nine, um, it works in multiples of three. So we're going to work it out to three plates first is equal to how many bowls. So if we have a look, we need to divide it by two here. And the same thing here, divided by 2. So 4 divided by 2 is 2 bowls. And if we look at 3 to 9, it's times 3. Same thing here, times 3. So 2 times 3 is equal to 6 bowls. And so therefore, we have gotten to our answer that 9 plates is equal to 6 bowls, which is why the answer is A, 6 bowls. So boys and girls, what you need to do in these kinds of questions is write out a number sentence that you can see and then you can slowly work your way down to get to your answer. I don't think this method has ever failed. And remember, math is all about trying to find out if one part equals to this part, what would that other part equal to? Okay, so let's move on to the next part, next page, which is question 16. Now, I think this is only a so I don't think we can zoom into this, but having a look at question 16, it says this. Carl draws five squares on dotted paper and each square looks like this. So you can see each square looks like that and we're going to just work out the area as we go. So if it's a square, both sides are the same. So it's going to be four by four, um, which is equal to 16 centimeters squared. Now the question is he connects the dots to make shapes inside the squares, as you can see here. All of them are connected with dots and you can see some shaded parts within each. And the question is, which of the drawings has exactly one quarter shaded? So let's first work out what that area of one quarter is. So we need to go one quarter of 16. And once again, to work this out, we divide. So 16 divided by four is four centimeters squared. So let's have a calculate for each one. If it's four centimeters squared, it's essentially like four squares being colored in, okay? Whichever way they are. Now, if we have a look at diagram A, we've got one, two, three, so it can't be diagram A. Diagram B, we've got one, and then we've got two connected together. So that's only two, so it can't be diagram B. Um, drawing C has one, two, three, four, five, so that's too much, so it can't be drawing C. Drawing D, we've got one, two, three, four. So drawing D is four, a quarter of um, the drawing shaded. And drawing E, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, which is too much as well. So that means our answer to, we've only got one drawing that's exactly a quarter shaded. And so our answer to question 16 is D. Quite straightforward, once you can first work out the area of this, then, and work out how much is a quarter, then you'll be able to slowly solve your way through this. All right, let's keep going. Having a look at question 17. So question 17 is the following question. It says, Janely spins a spinner like this. Now the spinner has different colors and numbers on each face. Each of the six sections has an equal chance of being landed on. So you can see here, um, this is what, the spinner options are. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, six different parts, um, different numbers on it, as well as different colors as well. Now the question is, which of these statements are correct whenever Janely spins the spinner? So we've got number one, the spinner is equally likely to land on an odd or an even number. 
um, if we have a look at that, let's slowly debunk these because the question is we need to find out which of these statements are actually correct within here. So if we have a look, an odd number, we've got 5, 3, and 1. And even numbers, we've got 4, 2, and 2. So there are three odd numbers and three even numbers, so it is indeed equally likely. So number 1 is a correct statement. Now, if we have a look at number two, it says, if the spinner lands on black, then the number is odd. So we've got one, three, and five. Um, and it is all three of those numbers are odd. So statement two is also correct. Now, if we have a look at statement three, it says, if the spinner lands on an even number, then the color is gray. So an even number, we've got 4, 2, and 2, but that's actually incorrect because our second lot of 2 here is on white, not gray. So that means statement 3 is not correct. And then we've got statement 4, which is if the spinner lands on white, then it is impossible for the number to be odd. So if the spinner lands on white, then it is impossible for the number to be odd. Now that is true because we've only got one number in a white space and that is the number two and that's even. So that means which statements are correct? Our answer to this question is B, statements one, two and four only. So in this question, it's a matter of analyzing each of these statements to see if it follows the criterias or um, the diagram shown below. Um, and if it satisfies it, then that's the correct answer. So our answer to question 17 is B. All right, let's have a look over the page to the next set of questions. We've got starting with question 18, the following. So it says here, there are four cardboard boxes, P, Q, R, and S. Now we've got some clues. It says box P is three kilograms heavier than box Q. We've got box Q is five kilograms lighter than box R. Then we've got box S is four kilograms lighter than box R. Now it says, what is the difference in weight between the heaviest box and the lightest box? So if we have a look here, I'm going to, like all of them are comparing itself to each other. So what we're going to do is I'm going to actually start off by um, with the first number sentence and then slowly working our way through it. So we know that box P is three kilograms heavier than box Q. So I'm going to say that box Q is triangle. We don't know how much it is, but it, it's a triangle. And box P is three kilograms heavier. So that means if this is box Q's thing, plus three is equal to box P. Now, if we keep going, box Q is five kilograms lighter than box R. That means box R is five kilograms heavier than box Q. So box Q is triangle plus five kilograms is equal to box R. Now, box S is four kilograms lighter than box R. So that means that box X, box S, so box R is triangle plus five, but we know that Box S is four kilograms lighter than then, so we're gonna minus four as well. So technically, box S is actually triangle, five minus four is equal to plus one. So it's actually one kilogram heavier than box Q. So let's order it because we need to then find out what the difference in weight is. So difference means to minus. So if we have a look, we've got box Q. Box Q is equal to triangle. Then we've got box S, which is equal to triangle plus one. And then we've got box P, which is equal to triangle plus three. So it's just ordering them. And then box R is equal to triangle plus five. So the difference in weight between the lightest and heaviest. So we've got the lightest here and the heaviest here. And the only difference between them is five kilograms. So our answer to question 18 is A, five kilograms. All right, so let's keep going down to question 19. Okay, so question 19 says this, Jake decides to call a number thriving if it has the same remainder when it is divided by three as it is when it is divided by five. So which of these numbers would Jake call thriving? Okay, so Basically, what we've got to understand in this question is understand what it means to be a number that is thriving, okay? And essentially, it's having that same remainder when it is divided by 3 or when it is divided by 5. So what we've got to do is we've actually got to divide each of these numbers by 3 and 5 to work out what that remainder is. 
And if it's the same remainders, that means it is um, it is the same. Okay. So if we have a look here, we've got the following number. We've got. Let's try out this one. So eight divided by three. And luckily, because it's small numbers, it's something we can do mentally in our heads quickly. So three, six, so that's two. And then we've got a remainder of two. Now let's try, if, let's see if eight is thriving. So divided by five. So eight divided by five is one. And then we've got a remainder of three. Then we've got 11 divided by three, which is equal to um, three, six, nine. So that's three, remainder two as well. 11 divided by 5 is equal to 2, remainder 1, which doesn't work. Then we've got 17 divided by 3, which is equal to 3, th uh, 5, 10, 15, so, or 3, 6, 9, 12, 15, so that's 5, remainder 2. 17 divided by 5 is equal to 3, remainder 2 as well. So, if you have a look, let's just focus on the remainders. So, in when we divided 8 by 3 and 5, the remainder was 2 and 3, so this is not a thriving number. 11 divided by 3, remainder 2, gave us a remainder of 2. 11 divided by 5 gave us a remainder of 1, which is not the same, so it's not thriving. And if we have a look at here, we've got 17 divided by 3 is 2. 17 divided by 5 gave us a remainder of 2 as well. So this number, 17, was the only number that was thriving. And so... Which of these numbers would Jake call thriving? Our answer is D, 17 only. All right, so that's our answer to question 19. All right, let's have a look at the next part, question 20. So question 20 says this. Lakshmi has 29 five cent coins. So 29 five cent coins. I'm going to just work that out. So as we're going, so 29 times five cents is equal to... And if we actually work this out, 29 times 5 is equal to 45, 10, 14. So that's 145 cents, which is actually $1.45. So we're going to write that down. $1.45. Now it says here that she wants to exchange as many of her 5 cent coins as she can so that she has the same amount of money but as few coins as possible. Now she can only exchange them for 10 cent, 20 cent or 50 cent coins or a mixture of these. So after she has made the exchange, how much coins will she have in total? So we need to just work out combinations of $1.45. And so in this case here, um, $1.45, to be able to make this, we can use two 50 cent coins so that's already makes one dollar and then we can use two 20 cent coins so she's actually only 20 cent coins and then she's got to keep that five cent coin because that's the smallest in value to make 20 cents so if we look here that's already one dollar and 20 20 is 40 cents and then we've got five cents so how many coins will she have in total she will have in total one, two, three, four, five coins in total. So our answer to question 20 is B, five. All right, so that, that's our answer to question 20. Over the page to question 21. So question 21 says this. It says the Williams family invite their neighbors to a barbecue. So the Williams family invite their neighbors to a barbecue. There are 21 children at the barbecue. Now the column graph shows their ages. Okay, so we've got the number of children here and their ages. Now it says all the children line up in order of their ages. What is the age of the child standing in the middle of the line? So as you can see here, boys and girls, um, you have to be able to understand this group this graph to then be able to work out what is the age of the child standing in the middle once they've all lined up from the youngest to the oldest. And so what you'll notice is this. This is the number of children that are six years old. The number of children that are seven years old, eight, nine, 10, 11, and 12. And so what you've got to do is you've got to understand that this one of these is one child, okay? is Remember this, boys and girls. One of these is equal to one child. And so if we have a look here, we're going to slowly cross out these boxes as we go from back and the front. So then we can then come to our center amount, okay? And so in this case here, um, we start off with the six-year-olds and the 12-year-olds. So let's cross them out. So we've got one and then here, another one. Then 
as we cross out, let's go to the 11, and then here to the 10, to the top, down, down, and then we slowly got to make sure it's even as we go. And then we'll come to our center, which is eight years old. So this is the child that's standing in the middle of the line. And so our answer to question 21 is B. Um, boys and girls, there is a mathematical way to work this out as well. What you can do is you can count the number of children there are. So there are 21 children at the barbecue, right? And so what you need to do is you need to find that middle number and then you need to count um, to get to that amount. So if we have a look here, um, between 21 and 21, 21 divided by 2 is 10.5. So if you count 10.5 um, from here, so that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And so that's the 11th one. That's going to be 8. And if you count from this side, that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And this is 10.5. 10.5 and 10.5, so this is your exact halfway point. So that's another way that you can actually work it out as well. Okay, so there's two ways. One's a bit more of a visual way. The other one is a bit more of a mathematical way to solve this. All right, over the page, having a look at question 22. So question 22 looks at the following questions. It says six different numbers are written in order from smallest to largest. So we've got our smallest number all the way to our largest number. Now it says that each of these rectangles is covering the same digit. So um, these blue ones are all the same digit and each of these hexagons is covering the same digits as well. So these red ones are also the same digit. Now what we've got to do is we have to find the total of the digit under the square or the rectangle, the blue rectangle, and the digit under this red hexagon, okay? Now the key thing is knowing that finding the total means to find, if you add them up together, how much would it totally equal to? So remember, boys and girls, these cards have been, or these numbers have been ordered from smallest to largest. So that's a clue to tell us what these numbers could potentially be. And so if you have a look here, um, if we have a look here, we've got the center numbers, 3, 2 something and 3, 2, 5. That means this red number has got to be smaller than 5. Okay, so it could be, it's got to be smaller than 5 for this to work out here. And if we have a look at these numbers here, we've got 1 something 7 and um, something 3, 8. So that means this blue one, and if you have a look at the next number, it's a 300. So that means it's actually got to be, this blue one's got to be between the numbers 1 and 3 for it to work here as well. And so if we have a look here though, in these numbers, so we're just like it's a matter of comparison. If we look at the last two numbers here as well, this is a one and it ends with a five. So this one can't be a one as it can't be a one. So it's got to be either a two or a three in this case here. Now it can't, if we have a look, it can't be a three because three, three, eight is bigger than three, two, three, two, whatever this, the red one is. So that means we've we can conclude that our number here has got to be a 2. So the blue we've worked out is a 2, just by looking at the orders of the numbers and experimenting. So now that it's, we know it's a 2, if we have a try of other numbers, 3, 2, 1, um, if this is a 1, it wouldn't, if this was a 1, 105, 125 would not make it order the smallest. So if we have a look, it can't be a 2 either. It's got to actually be bigger than 300. So it's got to be... A four then. So that means we've concluded that our red is also is going to be a four. And so we know that that's two, that's four. The total number of these digits is going to be two plus four, which is equal to six. So therefore our answer to question 22 is six. So once again, it's knowing our our having a knowledge of our numbers and knowing what the rule is, smallest to largest, um, and working it out. I mean, you can always like guess and check to see if it works out, but you can always like this is your probably your biggest clue that will help you immediately narrow down your options to, 
um, of your number of digits because realistically we've got digits one to nine which means you've got to try it one two three four five six seven eight nine which takes a lot longer but if you were able to narrow it down between these choices then it becomes a lot easier to work with all right so that's question 22 let's have a look at question 23 so question 23 says this sylvie separated a box of cherries into three piles now for every two cherries she put in the first pile she put five cherries in the second pile and three cherries in the third pile until there were no cherries left over now when sylvie had finished there were 24 cherries in the third pile how many cherries were in the box altogether so this is a bit of a ratios question but we're going to organize our information to a table so we've got box one then we've got box two and then we've got box three. Now we know that for every two cherries she puts in the first box, she puts five in the next one and three in the next one. Now when Sylvia has finished, there are 24 in the third pile. So we want to find out how many cherries were in the boxes altogether or the piles. So what we're going to do is we're going to go, okay, how does three get to 24? We need to multiply by eight. So the same thing here, multiply by eight, which is equal to 40. And then we've got to multiply by eight, which is equal to 16. So how many cherries were there all together? So we've got to add all of these up. 16 plus 40 plus 24 is equal to what? And so if we add them up, 604 is 10, carry on the one, four, five, six, seven, eight. So that is going to be 80 cherries altogether. So our answer to question 23 is equal to C. All right, so that's question 23. Okay, so let's have a look at question 24. So question 24 says this, the numbers 0 0.2, 0 0.12, 0 0.09, 0 0.1 and 0 0.17 can each be placed under a mark on this number line. So we've got this number line here and there's an indication of X within here. And it says which number must be at X. Now what we're gonna do is this, we know that all of these numbers can be placed on the number line. So we're gonna first identify what our largest and our smallest number is and place them on either end. So in this case here, we've got 0 0.09 being our smallest number. So we're gonna place it here, 0 0.09. And so that's done. And 0 0.2 is our largest number. So we're gonna put 0 0.2 at the end over here. Now if we have a look, um, our second number is 0 0.1, which is immediately after 0 0.09. And then 0 0.12, so 0 .0, 0 0.11, 0 0.12 is going to be here. And then if we have a look, that means 0 0.17 is our only option to fit within here. But we're going to just check it out to see if it actually makes sense. So 0 0.12, 0 0.13, 0 0.14, 0 0.15, 0 0.16, and 0 0.17 indeed does fit here. And if we continue on 0 0.18, 0 0.19, and 0 0.2, it does all match accordingly. So that means our answer to question 24 is equal to E, 0 0.17. So our answer to question 24 is E. All right, having a look at question 25. So question 25 says this, three jugs X, Y, and Z contain some liquid. So we've got jug X, jug Y, and jug Z. Now it says jug Z has a total capacity of one liter. Kim pours liquid from jugs X and Y into jug Z until jug Z is full. Now afterwards, how much liquid is left in jugs X and Y altogether? So what we know is that we've got to slowly, the whole idea is from jug X and jug Y, it is used to fill up jug Z all the way to the top. And then we want to find out how much is left over within here. Now, if we have a look here, we know that jug Z has a capacity of one liter. So we're going to draw up to there is equal to one liter, which is equal to 1000 milliliters. Okay. So if we actually work our way through this, this is going to be 500. This is 250. 750 and then finally a thousand now we already know that there is 250 so that means to fill this more we need 750 mils more now if we have a look here jug x has 400 mils and jug y has between 400 and 600 jug y has 500 milliliters so that means Jug X and Jug Y have a combined amount of 900 mils. So 
We want to find out how much liquid is left in jugs X and Y altogether. Well, 750 mils is more needed for jug Z. So we're going to have to go, okay, 900 mils minus 750 mils to then to work out that 150 mils is leftover for jugs X plus Y. And so, and 750 mils was what was needed for jug Z. And so, our answer to question 25 is B, 150 mils. All right, so that's question 25. Let's move down to question 26. So question 26 says this. Julian has square tiles that each have sides of length 50 centimeters. Now his tile cover an area of two and a half square meters. So it says, how many tiles does Julian have? So we're going to draw a little diagram just to give us a bit of an idea of what this means. So Julian has square tiles and each one is 50 centimeters. Now his tiles cover a total area. So a total area of two and a half so 2.5 meters squared okay that's the whole area and we want to find out how many of these tiles actually fit within this covered area so what we're going to do is this um, first of all we need to know that centimeters and meters squared are very different and converting from centimeter squared to meter squared is a little tricky so what i recommend boys and girls is a meet first changing this into square into meters so when you multiply it becomes square meters immediately and then it becomes easier to work out so if we have a look here we're going to work out that 50 centimeters is actually 0.5 meters and so to find out the area of one of these we have to go 0.5 times 0.5 and so 0.5 times 0.5 5 times 5 is 25, 5 times 0 is 0 plus 2, 0 times 5 is 0, 0 times 0 is 0, so add them up. So we've got 5, 2 and 0, 2 digits after the decimal place, so that's jumping 2 times. So that's 0 0.25 meters squared, okay? So that means the area of this is 0 0.25 meters squared. And so we're going to try and find out how many of these fit in within this bigger area. And so we'd have to go 2.5 meters squared divided by 0 0.25 meters squared. And when we divide with decimal points, we have to actually get rid of the decimal points. So we're gonna have to go jump two times. And so that means this is also jumped two times. So the new division is actually 250 divided by 25. And for that, um, if we actually work it out, 250 divided by 25 goes in once, 25 subtract to 0, bring down the 0, 0, 0, 0, so our answer is 10. Um, 10 tiles fit in within um, the total area of 2.5 square meters. So our answer to question 26 is D. All right, over the page to question 27. So question 27 goes like this. It says the time now is 3.30. So you can see it's 3.30. Um, and as you can see here, the hour hand is slowly moving so that it's on its way to 4 o'clock. Now it says the angle from the hour hand to the minute hand measure clockwise. So clockwise is in the direction of the clock is shown in red. So you can see it's here. Now it says five minutes later, the angle will be larger. So what type of angle will it be? So what we've got to do is this. We know, if you have a look really closely between the hour striking points between here, um, there are one, two, three, four, five points. So that means that there are five extra strokes or points or movements within 60 minutes and so that means in one point one point it moves to one point in 12 minutes now if you have a look here um the next five minutes later means that it hits the seven so it's going to be 335 we're not assuming that this has moved too much but now this is our um 
angle. And so you can see it is definitely bigger than 90 degrees. So we know that the angle that it will be is an obtuse angle. And this can be done through just observing very carefully um, the size of the angle and knowing how much a right angle can, how much is needed to create a right angle, which in this case would look somewhat like that. Okay, so it's just being able to compare between the different angles. And it does say that the angle will be larger in this case here. So that's why I answered question 27 is B, an obtuse angle. All right, let's have a look at the next question. So this is this question is quite an interesting question. Um, it does require you to visualize um, what could this potentially look like. So having a look at question 28, this is what it says. A newspaper is made from a pile of eight large sheets. Now it says the whole pile is folded in half and it says the pages are numbered one to 32. So it says which other pages are on the same page as the large sheet as page six. So it sounds a bit confusing, boys and girls, but if we draw a diagram, it becomes a lot easier. So what we know is I want you to imagine like a big large sheet has that has been folded together in half to create all these other extra pages. Now, and there are 32 different pages and we want to find out which other pages are on the same large sheet as page six. So let's make our way to actually drawing out this like newspaper and we're going to slowly separate it. So this would be our bottom page, that's one large sheet, two large sheets, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, and so you can imagine it if that this section here is your spine and it's been folded and this is your front and this is your back. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna fill in the page numbers. So if we have a look here, um, abs the absolute first page, this is page one in this case here, this would be your one. Now, as you can look, this would be your page two, page three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, and then across the page, this would be seventeen, seventeen. 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, and 32. And so now the question is, which of the pages are on the same large sheet as page six? So page six was here. So it's this strip of line. And so the numbers that were used was 5, 27, and 28. So our answer is B, 5, 27, 28. All right, so that's question 28. Okay, so over the page, we are now looking at pay question 29. Question 29 goes like this. It says, Leo has 100 cards numbered from 1 to 100. So 1 all the way to 100, okay? And it says he can use the cards to make chains of numbers. Now, this is where it can be a bit confusing about the rules, but once you understand it, um, it's a possible like it's definitely possible on how you can solve it so it says to make a chain leo chooses the first number so any of the first numbers between 1 and 100 and each number after that is made by multiplying the previous number by a single digit number greater than 1 so it's got to be bigger than 1 now it says here is a chain that starts with 1 and ends with 35 so 1 times 5 which is single digit so it goes to 5 5 times 7 gives you 35 and that's the end of this chain now it says here is a chain that starts with 1 and ends with 28 so 1 times 7 gives you 7, 7 times 2 gives you 14, and then 14 times 2 gives you 28. So it says, how many possible chains of any length start with 1 and end with 12? So what we've got to do is we've got to start solving for the different possibilities that give us, um, get us to 12. So remember, we're always going to start with 1 and then work our way through to get to 12. So if we have a look, we'll probably start off with our most simplest ones. So 1 times 3 gives us 3. 3 times 4, it's knowing our like multiples and our factors of 12, gives us 12 as well. That works. All right, let's try another one. So 1 
times 4 gives us 4 and then times 3 gives us 12. Then we've got 1 times 2 gives us 2 times 6 gives us 12. And then we've also got 1, so we can do the opposites of each one. Times 6 gives us 6, and then times 2 gives us 12. Now if we have a look here, this is not the only combinations, because boys and girls, as you can see as the example, you can actually repeat um, numbers. So technically, we can actually break down our 4s and our 6s to actually get to um, like our other numbers to work out different chains. And so we can actually think of a few more. We can go 1 times 3 is equal to 3. And then we can times 2, which is equal to 6. And then times 2 it again, which gives us 12. So that's one of them. And then we can also do 1 times 2 is equal to 2 times 2, which is equal to 4. And then times 3, which is equal to 12. So that's another one, 2, 2, 3. And we've got 3, 2, 2. And then if we have a look, we can try out another one. 1 times 2 is equal to 2. Times 3 is equal to 6. And then times it again by 2, which is equal to 12. And so, and that would be our only combinations, possible combinations. So if we have a look here, that's 1, 2, 3. 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. So how many possible chains of any length start with 1 and end with 12? Our answer to this case is D, 7 chains. All right, so that's question 29. Let's have a look at the next question, which is question 30. Question 30 says, how many of the numbers 1 to 99 have exactly one digit that is a 1? So it's listing, it's a matter of listing our numbers. So we've got 1. 10, 11, or not even 11 boys and girls because that's two digits that are 1. So 1, 10, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. Then we've got 21, 31, 41, 51, 61, 71, 81 and then 91 and so how many numbers from 1 to 99 have exactly one digit that is a 1 so if we count here we've got 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 13 14 15 16 17 18 so our answer to question 30 is c 18 numbers all right, so that's question 30. Over the page to having a look at question 31. So question 31 goes like this. It says, Marlene was preparing for a race. She ran the same distance every day for five days. And it says the graph shows a time taken in minutes to complete her run each day. So what we're going to do, just to make it a bit easier, we're going to write on top how many minutes each one took. So Monday, it took her 17 minutes. Tuesday, it took her 22 minutes. Wednesday, it took her 11 minutes. Thursday, it took her 15, 16, or it took us 17 minutes. And on Friday, it took her 24 minutes. So just being very careful and accurate when you're working through these. Now, what the question is asking us is which of these statements are correct based on this graph up above. So we've got number one, Marlene ran fastest on Friday. Well, it, Thinking about it, normally when we're comparing numbers, the higher the number, the better it is. But in this case here, when you're looking at time, that is not the case. So that means number one is incorrect. Then we've got number two. Marlene's time on Tuesday was exactly half of the time on Wednesday. So Marlene's time on Tuesday was exactly half of the time on Wednesday. That's not correct. It's the opposite way around. It should have been Marlene's time on Wednesday was exactly half of the time on Tuesday, which would have been a correct statement. Then we've got three. Marlene's total time running on Tuesday and Wednesday was the same as a total running time on Monday and Thursday. So Tuesday and Wednesday is 22 plus 11. So that's going to be 33. And then Monday and Thursday... So that's 17 plus 17, which is equal to 34. And so that's not the same. So 3 is incorrect as well. So that means our answer to question 31 
is that none of these statements are correct. So our answer is A. All right, have, let's have a look at question 32 now. So question 32 says this. Laura has three identical pairs of pink gloves and two identical pairs of yellow gloves mixed together in a drawer. Now left hand gloves are different from right hand gloves. She takes gloves out of the drawer one at a time without looking and puts them on a shelf. What is the smallest number of gloves she must take out to be certain they include a left hand and a right hand glove of the same color? So let's first write down our different possibilities. And so she's got pink gloves. And in terms of her pink gloves, she's got three identical pairs. That means she's got three left ones, but she's also got three right ones. And the same thing goes with yellow. So she's got yellow gloves as well. And she's got two left ones and also two right ones. So we want to find out the smallest number that she takes out without looking and she'll get like a perfect match. And so in this case here, um, boys and girls, the answer to this is actually E6. Okay, and let me explain it to you. Imagine that she took out, without looking, three left-hand gloves. Okay, that's three left-hand gloves and that's all of them taken out. But then also we want to... What if she also takes out two left-hand gloves? That means all the left-hand gloves are taken. That's five left-hand gloves all taken. But we've still got the right-hand gloves to take out. And remember, he needs to make a perfect, um, perfect like glove match. And so if all five um, left-hand gloves or even five all five right hand gloves are taken out that means both colors have been accounted for we've got both of those colors but that means it's a matter of picking out the next one which could have been a right pink glove or a right yellow glove and that's the sixth one taken out which would mean it would make a pair okay we're just ma in imagining the different possibilities so it could have been um pink left pink left pink left and then a uh, yellow left and then a yellow left that's no pairs can be making, but then that means all of these have been gone. And that means the next possibility could have been a pink right or a yellow right. And that would have made a perfect pair, yellow left, yellow right, or even a pink left and pink right. And so that means we need one, two, three, four, five, six, different pullouts for it to actually create a pair um, to make an identical pair of gloves that she can wear. So that's our answer to question 32 is E. It's a bit tricky to understand, but um, I think it's best if you actually try it out to see if it actually works as well. All right, so let's have a look at question 33. So question 33 says this, Peter has six identical paper triangles shown here. All the sides of every triangle are the same length. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, and six. And it says he can put some of these together to make different shapes, turning them if needed. So for example, he can put four triangles together like this to make a larger triangle. So four triangles, so one, two, three, and then four. Now it says, which of the following shapes can Peter make by combining two or more of his triangles with no gaps between triangles and no overlapping triangles? So if we have a look here, um, it's a matter of actually trying out to see if you can actually make these, make like a shape from here. So there's no gaps and no overlapping triangles. So let's try making these. So we can make a hexagon and our boys and girls, I'll show you how to do that. So and remember, we've got up to six that we can use. So to make our hexagon, we use all six triangles. And so hexagon has been made. Now we can also make a parallelogram. We don't need to use all six, but a parallelogram works out very well. Um, if we have a look at our other options, square is not possible to make because the thing about squares, boys and girls, is that it has to be all rigid vertically and horizontally, but we can't actually do that when um, our triangles are all equilateral triangles and they're not, there's no upright one that goes diagonally like this, okay? And so that means um, the only possibility um, shapes that P Peter can make 
when combining two or more triangles is our answer is C, hexagon and parallelogram only. So that's question 33. All right, so let's have a look at over the page to question 34. So question 34 says this. A white piece of paper has a grid and some wet paint on it as shown, okay? So white piece of paper has some grids and wet paint shown. So we can see that some squares are painted yellow and some squares are painted blue. Now it says the paper is folded along the dotted line and pressed together. If a blue square and a yellow square are pressed together, both squares will gr be green when the paper is unfolded. After the paper is unfolded, how many green squares will there be? So technically what they're saying is green is equal to yellow plus blue and so in this case here it's a matter of seeing the squares to see how they match up to give you that green and so in this case we just need to see symmetrically which ones um, face together and so we can see that this yellow one will match with this one and this yellow will match with this blue one to make green and this one will match with this one to make green as well. So that means that there will be six green squares together because it's not only just one side, it's going to be the other side as well that will be mixing to make you that green color. So our answer to question 34 is E6. All right, let's have a look at our last question for um, this paper. So if we have a look, we've got question 35, which says this. Here is a number sequence, so we got 2, 2 and a third, 2 and 2 thirds, 3 and 3 and a third. And so you can see that um, there is a pattern that happens and you can see it is increasing by one third. And it says the first number in the sequence is 2, after that add a third every time to get the next number. And so the question is what is the 34th number in this sequence? So there's actually quite a lot that's happening within here. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to slowly work our way through this. So um, if we have a look, we're going to just name these terms. This is the first one, number one, two, three, four, five. So this is five terms all completed. Now we're going to work it up to the next, we're going to work our way through the next 10 terms as we go. So what we're going to do is we are going to, um, so that's our fifth one. So we're going to write six, seven, eight, 9, 10, and slowly work our way through that. So our sixth term would be 3 and 2 thirds, and then the next number would be 4, 4 and a third, 4 and 2 thirds, and then 5. So within here, that was our first 10. Now what we're going to do is we're going to work out our next 10. So that's going to be 20. So that means to start our next one, it would be starting from 5 and a third. Now we need to work out how much does 2, the first 10 terms get from 2 to 5. It's increasing by 3. So that means we're going to increase this section by, this is our 11th term, so we want to work it out to our 20th term, is also having to increase by 3. So 5 and a third plus 3 is going to equal 2, 8 and a third. Now what we're going to do is we're going to work out the next 10 and it starts off with 8 and 2 thirds and this term is going to be our 21st to work out our 30th term. So we're going to once again plus 3 to that. 8 and 2 thirds plus 3 is equal to 11 and 2 thirds. So our 30th term is, I'm going to use keep to the color, so 30th, 31, 32, and 33, and then 34. So we know that our 30th term was 11 and 2 thirds, then it becomes 12, 12 and a third, 12 and 2 thirds, and then it becomes 13 as our 34th term. So what is the 34th number in our sequence? Our answer to question 35 is equal to D13. All right, so um, that's one way of working it out, boys and girls. But um, thinking about time-wise, that would make most sense. But all, what you can do is as well is you can actually work out what every single term is in here, but it does take a bit of a time. So it's better if you can see if there's a pattern. Um, I found that 
grouping it in tens was easy because then you've got 10, 20, 30, three different groups, and then you can work your way individually from 31 to 34, um, which is a lot quicker um, rather than writing out what the first, second, third, fourth is. Now, the key thing is knowing that from 10 to 11, they're different groups. And so you're adding a third to that. And this is where you can possibly make a mistake. So it's really important that you do check as you go along the way, because it's your um, it's a small increase and it uses fractions, which makes it a bit more trickier than what you'd expect. Okay, so, but that's question 35 and that actually concludes um, today's review of um, the 2022 and Mathematical Reasoning OC class placement test. Hopefully you had a better understanding, boys and girls, and it'd be really great if you um, that you've listened to it, you've written out the working out, but you also reattempt these questions again to see how well you've understood um, the methods that we've used to solve these questions. And um, I wish you the best of luck. Good luck.